Well, as you're seated, turn to Matthew chapter 5. Today we're going to conclude our series on the Beatitudes. Just reviewing for a moment, you'll remember it was in Matthew chapter 4 that Jesus was uh, walking there along the Sea of Galilee and he noticed that there was a group of folks following him, a large multitude, and he instructed that uh, they be seated. And as we know now, when you go over to Israel and you look there at the, uh, the uh, Mount of Beatitudes, you realize it's almost like a stadium seating. And you can just picture this large crowd as they're, they're lined up and seated along this, this hillside and Jesus there at the base and he's teaching. And these folks were there because they wanted to see his, his miracles. They might have wanted some food, all those different things, but it came down to this. Jesus began to tell them what real kingdom living looked like. And he wasn't interested in drawing the crowds. In fact, he was whittling it down. He was telling them what true discipleship looked like. And so as we look at that, I want to review with you just for a moment this morning. The Beatitudes are, are the idea of this is how you get happy in life. This is how you live a kingdom life. This is where real contentment comes. The problem is that it's not like what we would say. Jesus put it this way, God blesses those who are poor. And they realize their need for him, for the kingdom of heaven is theirs. God blesses those who mourn, for they will be comforted. God blesses those who are humble, for they will inherit the whole earth. God blesses those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. And you remember the week that I preached on that, hungering and thirsting for righteousness. Who's, her, who's righteous? Jesus Christ. Blessed are they who hunger and thirst after the bread of life. They're not going to be hungry anymore. He who drinks of that living water isn't going to be thirsty anymore. So we know that following Christ brings that fulfillment. God blesses those who are merciful, for they should be shown mercy. And we talked about the difference in compassion, the difference in grace, the difference in mercy. Mercy is forgiveness. It's by grace through faith that we're saved, but it's only a result of God's mercy, His forgiveness of our sin. God blesses those whose hearts are pure, for they will see God. God blesses those who work for peace, for they will be called the children of God. Now today we're going to conclude Matthew chapter 5. We're going to go through verses 10 through 12. And he says this, Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake. Who's righteous? Jesus Christ. Blessed are those who are persecuted for Christ's sake. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when they revile and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven, for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Now when we talk about persecution, you already understand this is not going to be an easy sermon today, right? No, if I ask this morning, how many of you came here today because you want to learn how to be persecuted? There's not a hand in the building. But when we get to this idea of becoming a disciple of Jesus Christ, if I said, how many of you are here today because you want to learn how to become a disciple, most of the hands in the building would go up. But this is not what you expected. You want to be a disciple? You're going to be persecuted. Let's start this morning by talking about what the different types of persecution are. If you're following along in your sheet, you'll see that we're going to start with religious persecution. Religious persecution, that's defined as being persecuted for your faith persecuted for your faith. Now, we understand there are groups around the world that are being persecuted for their faith. We pray for the persecuted church. We talk about those that are in an underground church. We talk about those who don't get to worship freely like we do this morning. When you think of what's going on around the world, you've heard of a small country called Afghanistan, haven't you? You've heard of groups called Taliban or ISIS-K, killing Christians. If you haven't seen, it's already happening and uh, has been for many, many, many years. If those are people that are calling themselves Christ followers, they put their life at risk today more than maybe even before. Ethnic cleansings, we've read about them, we've heard about them. There are nations around the world, countries around the world, where people are, are executed literally for nothing more than they are a follower of Jesus Christ. That's why they're killed. The mass graves, you've heard about it, where they will take the bulldozers and they will dig out literally trenches and they will kill people for nothing more than being a Christian. They will push the bodies of the people into these mass graves and cover them up. What'd they do wrong? They were followers of Jesus Christ. 
Nothing less, nothing more. That's why they died. We don't, we don't understand that in this nation. We have a, a Christianity of convenience, a comfortable Christianity. We don't worship like the group we saw on TV, out, out on the, the video there, where it's outside under a tree. We've got a beautiful building. The AC works well. The pews are padded. I can go a long time with padded pews, right? You think about it. We don't, we're not persecuted. What we call persecution are simple inconveniences. But you begin to look at this and you understand that around the world, there are people that are dying for their faith. You read Fox's Book of Martyrs. If you've never read it, I encourage you to do so. People who literally were persecuted and died for their faith. People who, that as they were tied to the burning stake, were singing great hymns of the faith, praising God as the flames rose around them. That's a lot different than what we hear today. It wasn't about the smoke and mirrors. It wasn't about drawing the crowds. It wasn't about their convenience and comfort. It was all about Christ. All about Christ. It's different. Today it's different. So Jesus, you can picture him there as he's teaching these people and he's saying this is different. Talking about religious persecution, let's go on. We'll talk about political persecution as another type. The definition, what is it? Basically just being persecuted for your political views. We hear about political prisoners around the world. We've heard about revolutions. We've heard about revolutionaries, people that are giving their lives so that things will be changed and different in their nations. Some of you, because of our location here in South Florida, some of you have come from those countries, those environments where there has been political persecution. People have escaped. We've just heard about it this week. Another political prisoner that had come from Cuba years ago that now uh, losing a home. All these things. You hear about political prisoners. We don't understand that here in the United States. Not here. We're not arrested for our faith. <laughs> May surprise you. Hang on. You ready? Our nation is divided politically. That was revealing, wasn't it? I mean, that shocks every one of you. Do you realize there's persecution coming? You're going to see it here like I don't know that we've ever seen it before. And I want you to be ready because as we talk about religious persecution and political persecution, I am not a doomsdayer. I'm not one that's going to tell you that the world's coming to an end or chicken little. I'm going to tell you that the Bible talks about end times. I can't say that we're there yet. People ask me, preacher, are we in the end times? My answer is the same every day. We're one day closer than we were yesterday. That's all I know. But as you look at this, the reality is that as you think about this political persecution and the changes that are taking place, I'm watching around the world as it's coming, and it's coming in our nation too. People are getting into fist fights because they're on different, they represent or believe in different political parties. You stand in a line and you say you're for this party or this party, and all of a sudden before you know it, you're cold cocked for nothing more than an opinion. It used to be that we could share opinions and it made us better. We could have differing viewpoints, and I'd listen to yours, you'd listen to mine. I'd learn from you, you'd learn from me. We would defend what we believe by a conversation. And if we couldn't defend it, it would challenge us to say, well, maybe they know more than I do. Maybe I'm missing something, and, and it would sharpen us a little bit. Now, if somebody disagrees, all of a sudden, you know, that words are flying, or fists are flying, or guns are pulled, because we just have a different view. You look at the issues of abortion and how they're, they're just tearing our nation apart. You look at laws that are being passed and judges that are coming in. Folks, I have told you before, abortion is not a political issue. If you believe it's a political issue, you've never read the Bible. The Bible's very clear. We have a God who values life from conception to the grave. God is the giver and the author of life. But there are people that will literally get in a fight over your stance or view on abortion. Let me tell you something. If you read the Bible, you study it out, there won't be a disagreement in this room this morning. We will be in one accord because we've read the, the Word of God and we understand what God thinks about life in general. LGBTQ, different letter added every week. I tell you something, again, it's not a political issue. It's a biblical issue. You say, preacher, all this, this, this persecution of people. Let me tell you, you ain't seen it yet. You ain't seen nothing yet. Because now when you simply quote what Scripture teaches 
And if it's varying away from or against what society thinks or the political views think, now you're labeled a hate speaker. It's hate speech because you believe the Bible. Come on, folks. We have seen nothing yet. You better get ready. Non-binary, uh, gender identity, transgender. It changes day to day. Again, tomorrow I want to be a car, I'm a car. We, we get all this stuff going. I'm telling you, we live in a crazy society. Who would have ever believed Aerosmith was prophetic in a song? Dude looks like a lady. <laughs> it's like, come on. When we think about this stuff, we got to come back to Christians have to stand up for what we believe. But I'm going to tell you this morning that the church of Jesus Christ has so conditioned ourselves to be audience-driven, crowd-driven. We are more concerned about how many seats are in the pews than how many missionaries we send around the world. We're more concerned about whether or not we checked our, our, our service off or what time we get out than whether or not somebody comes to know Christ. When you begin to look and see what Scripture says, I'm going to tell you, there are going to be persecutions like we have not seen. We live in a day and age where we saw where the church stands with COVID-19. People are exercising fear, not faith. Persecution's coming. You say, preacher, why do you say that? Because Jesus told us it was. That's what happens do you understand it's in all these nations around the world except ours right now? I mean, when you get to this point to where we have the open border, and I'm not trying to get political this morning, but I want you to understand, when it's a, a y'all come kind of thing and people are bringing all their beliefs from all around the world into one place, do you not realize that when they settle together, there are going to be times where folks begin to attack Christianity, where it, it, it takes on a different view. You realize that in Minnesota now, there are places where there are folks that drop their prayer cloths and the Islamic prayers play over the loudspeakers. That's the United States of America. Again, I'm not trying to be an extremist. I'm just telling you that the Bible is prophetic in what it says. And if we don't know our Bibles, we're going to get caught up in the same arguments. We're going to buy into the same junk we're going to start backing and believing things that are ungodly because we want to be politically correct. We're afraid of persecution. We're not going to stand up because if we say something, well, that's not a, that's not a popular view. So instead, we're silent and we allow evil to prevail. That's different from the early church. What I just described to you with today's church is not what the early church saw. The early church was faced with an expanding Roman Empire. Think about this for a minute. It eventually led to emperor worship. Crowds would begin to cry out, Caesar is Lord. The early church said, Jesus is Lord. They wouldn't bend and cave in. You know what happened? It was political persecution because they refused to compromise. And yet today's church, we waver. William Barclay, in his commentary, The Gospel of Matthew, on page 112, states this. Nero wrapped the Christians in pitch, and he set them alight. And he used them as living torches to light his gardens. He sowed them in the skins of wild animals and set his hunting dogs upon them to tear them to death. They were tortured on the rack. They were scraped with pincers. Molten lead was poured hissing upon them. These things are not pleasant to think about, but these are the things a man had to be prepared for if he took his stand with Christ. I want you to understand something. The world around us is changing. And the church of Jesus Christ has changed, again, to a comfortable the casual Christianity. To follow Jesus Christ is not to say you're going to get rich and life is going to be great. And when you get into the prosperity gospel and you just call on Jesus and everything works out, I don't see that in the scriptures. You see people who were denied from their families, who were exiled, people who were put. The, when you think about the Isle of Patmos, Revelation, John was exiled. That's Christianity, not modern day. But that's what was taking place back then. 
We have religious persecution, political persecution. What about personal persecution? The definition there would simply be, it's because of who you are. Now, some things we cannot control. Some we just can't change. You can't change your skin color. If somebody's persecuted and they end up with all the stuff that's going on across our nation with racism, listen, we can't change skin color. We can't change lisps or limps or looks. I guess if you have enough money, you can change your looks. Um, Disabilities. I mean, all these different things that we cannot change, that we're persecuted for, bullied for, the cyberbullying, whether it's on the playground in elementary school or from adults on social media, it takes place. But there are some things that we can control. A hot temper, if it gets you in trouble, you get persecuted because you couldn't keep your mouth shut and you were mean and nasty to somebody or you exercised road rage and the reality is, listen, that's not suffering for, per- for righteousness sake. That's suffering for stupidity. Antagonistic, if you're a person that's just constantly antagonizing others and somebody finally <laughs> takes you out, listen, that's not for Christ's sake. That's because you should have kept your mouth shut. If you have a foul mouth and you can't control yourself, there are things that we can control and there are things from birth that we can't control. Personal persecution is not what we're talking about here. Those things we bring on ourselves. What Jesus is talking about here in this passage is the suffering that comes because of righteousness sake, because we're a follower of Jesus Christ. So let's move on quickly here. The persecution of Christians. I want us to start with the early church. Persecution has taken place for years. Early on, reviled, persecuted, slandered. The early church, about 300 years. It was heavy, heavy, heavy. They were going against the flow. It's written about in Scripture. Let me give you a couple of illustrations. Matthew 16, verse 24, Jesus said to his disciples, If anyone wants to or desires to come after me, let him deny himself. Well, that's exciting. Deny yourself. Put your own things aside. You're going to be a follower of me. You write yourself off. That's not today's Christianity. He said, Take up his cross. That's a hard step. And follow me. You want to be a disciple of Jesus Christ, deny yourself, take up your cross. Matthew chapter 10, verse 16, it starts, Behold, listen to what he says, I send you out as sheep in the midst of wolves. Drop down to verse 17. But beware of men, for they will deliver you up to councils and scourge you in their synagogues. You will be brought before governors and kings for my sake as a testimony to them and to the Gentiles. Drop down to verse 21. Now brother will deliver brother to death. Father to his child. Children will rise up against parents and cause them to be put to death. Verse 22. And you will be hated by all for my name's sake. Christians. We as a Christian nation, when you go around the world, you're hated. For what? Part of a Christian nation. You're a follower of Jesus Christ. Verse 23, when they persecute you in this city, flee to another. He says, it's going to happen. Just keep going. The apostle Paul did. He'd go into the synagogue. They'd throw him out. They'd try to kill him. He'd just go to the next place. We need to be faithful and not give up, not quit in the face of adversity. John 16, 2, they will put you out of the synagogues. Yes, the time is coming that whoever kills you will think that he offers God a service. Is that not what Islamic extremists believe about us right now? You do understand that that their goal in life is not peace. Their goal is you are evil, and their goal is to destroy you. Cut off the head of the serpent. Man, if they can take you out, you're good. They're offering to their God a sacrifice. You understand this. It goes on, not only here in the U.S., not only in the early church, but how about the persecution around the world? Look at this for a minute. Christians are being persecuted. I mentioned a few names to you earlier. Let me add a few more. Al-Qaeda, ISIS, Boko Haram, Muslim Brotherhood, Islamic extremists. Hey, those groups are still out there too. And according to the United States Department of State, Christians in more than 60 countries face persecution from their governments or surrounding neighbors simply because of their belief in the person of Jesus Christ. We in the United States don't understand this. We in the United States, not yet, that's right. We in the United States, we see it afar off and we act like it's not happening. 
we say pray for the persecuted church. We put them on our prayer list, and man, if they're on our prayer list, that's good. I want you to take a moment. I want us to be reminded today when we think about persecution, about what's taking place. I want you to turn your attention to the screens. We have a video by Open Doors that will show you what's happening around our world to Christians. What if your church had to meet in secret? What if spies watched your every move? What if following Jesus meant you faced violence or even death? Millions of Christians around the world experience these kinds of challenges every day. And these are the top 10 countries where faith costs the most. Number 10, India. Hindu extremists want to rid India of Christians and they are prepared to use extreme violence to achieve their goal. At number nine, Nigeria, where more Christians are murdered for their faith than in any other country in the world. Iran is at number eight. Secret house churches risk being raided by the police. If caught, be prepared for a long prison sentence. Number seven, Yemen, a war-torn country where Christians, if discovered, face the death penalty. Eritrea is at number six. If your faith is discovered, you can be imprisoned without trial in appalling conditions. Often, your loved ones don't even know if you're still alive. Number five, Pakistan. Say the wrong thing in Pakistan, and the notorious blasphemy laws could see you accused of insulting Islam and sentenced to death. At number four is Libya, a lawless land with no freedom of speech or belief. Somalia is number three on the list. Somali Christians can't reveal their faith to anyone or they could be killed, even by their own families. Number two is Afghanistan. If they find out you're a Christian, you have a stark choice. Flee the country or be killed. And at number one, North Korea, the most dangerous place in the world to be a Christian. Informants are everywhere. Discovery means death, either by execution or by being worked to death in a labor camp. At least 340 million Christians around the world experience high levels of persecution and discrimination. What if you could help them? For 65 years, Open Doors has stood alongside the persecuted church, strengthening Christians who dare to follow Jesus, no matter the cost. Your prayers and gifts enable our underground networks to reach millions of Christians with emergency food and aid, spiritual care, smuggle Bibles and Christian books, training and legal advice. But more than that, your support means that persecuted Christians know that they are not forgotten, not alone. After all, these are not strangers and they are not statistics. They are our brothers and sisters and they need our help. It's eye-opening, isn't it? Again, we in the United States don't understand religious persecution. The time is changing. We don't know if it's in our lifetime, our children's lifetime, but if things continue at the rate that they are, you're watching so many changes. I want to read you some things that I came across years ago. It's probably the best list that I've seen. In America is the next point on your sheet if you're following along. September the 17th, 2012, Michael Carl wrote, Faith Under Fire, Persecution of Christians on the Rise in the United States. He lists among the violations... Uh, in this joint report, all of these things that follow. Listen to these. A federal judge threatened incarceration to a high school valedictorian unless she removed references to Jesus from her graduation speech. City officials prohibited senior citizens from praying over their meals, listening to religious messages, or singing gospel songs at a senior activity center. A public school official physically lifted an elementary school student from his seat and reprimanded him in front of his classmates for praying over his lunch. 
Following U.S. Department of Veterans Affairs policies, a federal government official sought to censor a pastor's prayer eliminating references to Jesus during a Memorial Day ceremony honoring veterans at a national cemetery. A public school official prevented a student from handing out flyers inviting her classmates to an event at her church. The U.S. Department of Justice argued before the Supreme Court that the federal government can tell churches and synagogues which pastors and rabbis that they can hire and fire. The state of Texas sought to approve and regulate what religious seminaries can teach. The U.S. Department of Veteran Affairs banned the mention of God from veterans' funerals, overriding the wishes of the deceased's families. A federal judge held that prayers before a state house of representatives could be to Allah, but not to Jesus. That list is from 2012. I want you to think with me for a minute that during COVID lockdowns, think of how things changed. Prisoners were released from prison to minimize the spread of COVID, while pastors who opened their churches and preached the gospels were arrested and filled those same cells. Let me say that again. Prisoners were released from prison for fear of spreading COVID in those environments, and pastors were arrested and put in prison. That's here in the United States. I read this morning, Victoria, Australia. If the government has its way on October the 26th of this year, those that are unvaccinated can no longer attend public worship services. It just starts in one country and spreads to others. Canada, as you know, if you've been watching the news, is already chaining the doors of churches closed. They're not allowing places of worship to meet in some areas. What makes us think that we're immune to all of this? We're an ostrich with our head in the sand if we don't think that we better be ready. So I want to challenge you this morning. I want you to think about this. Look at the next point here, the impending danger, because Jesus tells it. Jesus lays this out. I want you to get the picture again. He's he's preaching to this multitude on the hillside. And as he's preaching, he's saying, if you want to be my disciple, you better get ready for persecution. Because if you follow me, there's a cost. Verse 11, he says, they will revile you. Revile you? But it says, blessed when they revile you for my sake. What's revile mean? To assail you with contemptuous language, to address you or speak to you abusively. He goes on, he says, and they're going to persecute you. Blessed are you when they revile and persecute you. What's persecution? That's when evildoers come after you just because you're doing good. That can be a physical approach. It can be a verbal assault. We see that it happened in Scripture. Give you some illustrations. Cain killed Abel. Because Abel offered the proper sacrifice. Joseph's brothers sold him into slavery because they were jealous. Samuel was rejected. Elijah was despised. Nehemiah was oppressed. Paul was beaten. Peter was thrown into prison. Stephen was stoned. James was beheaded. Jesus was crucified. Most of the disciples were martyred. John was exiled to the Isle of Patmos, as I mentioned. That's persecution. Then he goes on. He says, blessed are you when they revile you persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely they're going to slander you verse 11 it will have slander they talk falsely does it happen (laughs) oh does it happen it happens from people in the pews it happens from pastors and staff members it happens from people in the community it happens across denominations people will tell blatant lies they'll gossip they'll sow discord they are willingly being the mouthpieces of satan And they call it religious. And I'm going to tell you, Jesus said, blessed are you when it's for my sake. When it happens and we bring it on ourselves, that's different. But when it's for Christ's sake, you're blessed. And he closes out talking to these folks saying, hey, it's not going to be easy to be my disciple. You want to be my disciple? You have to follow me. And here's what you can expect. But listen to what he says. We know what happens in the end. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake. What does he say? Because those who endure the persecution, they keep their eyes on Jesus. Ultimately, heaven is their reward. We understand that. We understand what what Christ is telling them. He's saying it's worth it. 
It will be worth it all when we see Jesus. But you remember also the folks that for decades have sung the songs. How firm a foundation, except when COVID comes in. Oh, on Christ, the solid rock I stand. Until somebody tells me that I need to just do this, and, and then I cower down, and, and my faith goes into the back room while my fear steps out. What kind of God do we serve? He can't handle COVID. We serve a God that can't handle the problems of our lives. I want to challenge us as a church family today. I want to pastor people that we can help grow in their faith to where that when the time of persecution comes, that we don't cower down, that we stand firm in our faith and conviction. I want to tell you my observation. I believe we have a lot of folks that are committed to Christianity. But in the world, we have very few that are committed to Christ. People that are committed to denominations, people that are committed to local churches, people that are committed to Christianity. But when it comes to following Christ, that commitment is not quite so strong. And I want to challenge you. I want you to be a Christ follower. I want you to have a firm faith, one that where you knowing persecution is coming, like those who were tied to the stake as the flames spread, could say, God, I'm coming home. I will not denounce Christ. I will live for him no matter what. That's the kind of people I want us to be. So I want to ask you for just a moment, will you join me? Will you bow your heads and close your eyes for a moment? Again, not because it's spiritual, but because I just want you to do some introspection. And I want to ask you for a moment, would you ask yourself, do I know Jesus Christ as my personal Savior? Because if you're merely a churchgoer, you are lost. If you're merely religious and you don't have a relationship with Christ, you are wasting your time. Becoming a follower of Jesus Christ is a commitment. And as Jesus spoke to those people on that hillside, he knew he had a great crowd of people. And he knew that very few were really going to make the choice to follow him. And I'm asking you today, are you committed to Christianity? Or are you committed to Jesus Christ? Will you today say, God, I will follow you no matter what. If it costs me everything, as we sang earlier. For the cause of Christ, for this cause I live for this cause I die can you really say that this morning I want to ask you this morning have you been living in fear have you been living where your fear is prominent and your faith is, in, is like on vacation did you cower down or do you rise up when confronted with the issues? Do you want to be politically correct or do you want to be right with God? We sang this morning, I surrender all. I'm going to ask you now, heads are bowed, eyes are closed, the Holy Spirit is your witness this morning. Is that a true statement? Can you say and mean it? I surrender all. All to thee, my blessed Savior. I surrender all. One of my all-time favorite songs, I'd rather have Jesus than anything. Can you say that this morning? I'd rather have Jesus. I'm asking you this morning, where the rubber meets the road in your spiritual walk, I'm asking you, are you genuine? Do you really want to be a disciple of Jesus Christ? Because as he was whittling down the crowd on that hillside, that's what's going to happen in the days ahead. You'll watch. There'll be people that when things are going good, they'll fill the churches. And when the persecution comes, they're going to change their, their song that they sing. So I ask you this morning, do you know Christ is your Savior? If you are not 100% sure that you're going to heaven this morning, then I am 100% sure you're not. Because when you have a relationship with Jesus Christ, when you have committed to him, you know it. If I ask you this morning, are you 100% sure you're married? You would say yes or no. So why is it in our spiritual walk we're confused? 
You either know Christ or you don't this morning. And if you don't, I invite you, would you call out to him? Would you confess your sin? If you've been committed to Christianity and not Christ, today would you invite Jesus Christ to be your Lord and Savior and begin a relationship with him? If you're in the room this morning and the Holy Spirit has brought some things to your mind and there's conviction in your heart about something, would you confess it for a moment? If you've allowed your fear to dictate your world, your walk, would you confess that I'm going to do this this morning? I am just going to be silent. Give you a moment as Pastor Robert continues to pray. And right there in your pew, make that pew your altar this morning. And before a holy God who knows your thoughts, who knows your heart, would you please this morning come to a point where you say, I would rather be right with God than anything. If it's for salvation, if it's for recommitment, if it's a confession or repentance, right there in your seat, would you do what the Holy Spirit's laying on your heart? And I'll close this out in just a moment. Father, this morning, this is probably the toughest point in the Beatitudes. And I find it interesting that you, Jesus left it for last. That as he's speaking to the people on the hillside, and he's telling them, this is how you get happy in life. This is how you find contentment. This is what kingdom living looks like. He made some statements above that were against the flow, but when he came to the end, he said, you want to follow me, you can expect persecution. And blessed are those who endure to the end. God, this morning, there's not a person in this room that wants to be persecuted for our faith, but we need to begin to consider what real Christianity looks like. Do we just come when it's convenient? Do we just get to a point where in our in our weekly agenda, we simply check off a service, or are we beginning to really dig and grow and feed ourselves spiritually and become a person who would grow and withstand the persecution? God, as a pastor of this church, I pray this morning that you will create in us a congregation of people who aren't interested in what we're doing for us, but we're interested in what you'll be pleased with that we would want to be your disciples, to follow you, to share the good news of the gospel, to impact this world for all of eternity. God, I pray that we could truly say, I surrender all, knowing that really and genuinely we mean it. For those that don't know Christ today, I pray that they would find him as Savior and Lord. For those that have been away from you, Lord, I, I just call out to you and beg that your Holy Spirit would bring them back to yourself. And I pray that today the healing will begin and those who are hurting, those who have been away from you, Father, that we would be a church that's stronger than we've ever been because we are more committed to Christ than we have been. Prepare us for what lies ahead. But Lord, more than anything, create in us a desire to follow Jesus. And I pray that in his name. Amen.